the point of today's webinar, like we have done in the transformative agenda webinars, is really to be able to provide to the operations, to the field, practical guidance, practical suggestions, best practices, really the recipe on how we, the colleagues went about implementing and applying what we're going to be discussing about. So really don't hesitate to ask uh, questions. Now, um, unfortunately, we do not have the YouTube interactive uh, uh, streaming for this morning, but I want to let you know that today's webinar is recorded and will be made, made available at the site website within really a couple of days. So you can really take it and replay it to colleagues afterwards uh, if you want or if you want to um, download it. Today's webinar would last for about just under an hour and a half, and the way we're going to go about it is the first 45 minutes or so, I will be asking our three guests questions. So it will be an interactive trying to unpack, trying to better understand the rapid response mechanism. And then I'm going to take your questions. So it's really important that you keep on sending us questions which will try to ensure it is a two-way dialogue or a multiple-way dialogue as we go through this webinar. You already see on your screen a poll that we have put up. Please feel free to answer these uh, multi-choice questions. We're just trying to get a sense of where you are, what's your role, and how familiar you are with the topic uh, itself. Now, I'd like to introduce today's guest, and I'm really delighted we have uh, three colleagues who have joined us. I have with me, next to me here in Geneva, John Gink, who is familiar to many of you. John has worked for over two decades in the humanitarian field. Uh, currently, he's joining us in his capacity as the chair of the Interagency Standing Committee Emergency Directors Group. He's also the director for the operations division with the UN office in OCHA. He has held this position since uh, 2011. Prior to that, uh, John worked for uh, five years based in Gaza. He was the director for the UN Refugee Agency for Palestinian Refugees. And before that, he worked with the UN mission in Kosovo. He was with the OSCE in Bosnia. He's also worked with the GOL, going back, uh, the Irish NGO, um, going back to the, actually the Rwanda genocide and the aftermath to, that followed that. Uh, John, very welcome, and we're delighted to have you here with us. I'd also like to introduce, uh, joining us uh, from New York, Sylvia Denailov. Sylvia is the Chief Humanitarian Field Support Section, working at the Office of the Emergency Programs with UNICEF in New York. Before this job, she actually was working in uh, supporting the Haiti operation from headquarters. Before that, she was based in the Democratic Republic in Cong of Congo, in Somalia, in Myanmar. She also ha held a number of positions with NGOs. And uh, she's also worked with the government of uh, Switzerland. Uh, Sylvia, great to have you with us. I'd like to introduce now the third guest for this morning's webinar, and this is uh, Domitil Galli. Domitil is the emergency coordinator. She's actually the rapid response mechanism manager, uh, working with the Norwegian Refugee Council, and she's joining us uh, from Goma, Democratic Republic of Congo, where she's been based since uh, 2013 in Goma, although she has been in the Congo really for the last uh, four years, since 2011. Before that, uh, Domitil worked with the International Rescue Committee, she has worked with the French Development Agency, and she's also worked with the Action Contre la Faim, uh, based in uh, Paris. Domitil also comes with an extensive experience in various operations. So really, welcome to all three of you. Today's topic, we've really, it's a topic that I have to say came through a lot of the missions that we did through the Transformative Agenda Field Support Team. And the question really is about delivery. Uh, during the last few years, there's been a lot of discussion about coordination, how to ensure we don't duplicate, how can we work together better. Today is actually, we're going to look into the other side of the coin because I think we all agree that all the coordination, all our effort, bottom line is about delivering, about making sure that the people we're trying to help are receiving the help in, in, the most, in the fastest possible way. Today we're going to look at both global and country level mechanisms. The focus is really is about the rapid response mechanism, but we also would like to hear a little bit what exists from the global level. And I'd like actually to start the first question, I'd like to go to John. 
John, in your capacity as the Merchant Director, Chair of the Emergency Directors Group, um, you've just actually arrived last night from an Emergency Directors trip to Nigeria, to Ukraine, where you're looking at the humanitarian response there. I know colleagues really have been working all last night also to ensure the response in Vanuatu with the latest uh, emergency that is taking place. So I'd like to ask you, how do you see the different roles between the global and the country level in terms of being able to ensure a fast response and a fast delivery? John, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Panos, uh, and uh, thanks for this opportunity. Um, in terms of uh, being able to respond, uh, as you rightly said, our preoccupation now has to be on uh, delivery. Uh, we learned a lot of lessons from our performance in both uh, Haiti and Pakistan where um, we fell down on the actual organization of the response. So there was a huge effort through the transformative agenda of the last few years to, uh, as they would say, get our act together so that when uh, a very uh, large scale uh, crisis arises that we um, are ready to be able to deploy to understand what the needs are, communicate those, and then mobilize the, uh, the response. I mean, that's the objective of getting the right people out uh, quickly uh, on the ground uh, and getting the chaos uh, organized. Um, I would suggest that uh, we're, we're very much uh, better than we were on that. But the next phase is most definitely how to organize the response itself and to make sure that there is the capacity uh, to deliver. Um, and that, that now should become the new mantra, as you said in your opening uh, remarks. Looking at Nigeria and Ukraine, here's two very big crises um, right now and with potential to become even bigger in terms of the demands uh, placed on humanitarian organizations. Um, what do we need at the country level? Well, we need to understand uh, first and foremost what the situation is. So we need good information from colleagues at field level. Um, we also need to know what are the obstacles, if any, to uh, effective delivery. So, of course, this is looking very carefully at the access constraints. So that at the global level, we know what's needed and we know what uh, the challenges will be in uh, delivering to the affected populations. That's the, 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 the principal role of our field colleagues at the outset of any, uh, of any crisis. But then at the global level, we have to make sure that we are positioning ourselves to respond to both of those uh, uh, dimensions. Number one, that we mobilize the, 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 the field capacity to deliver, so the people, the operational people that are needed. Um, and secondly, that we get the supplies um, that, uh, that are needed out uh, quickly. Uh, that then, of course, means that at the global level, you've got to trigger uh, very fast financing mechanisms, um, the release of reserve supplies, um, because you can't have uh, colleagues standing out there uh, in the field without supplies um, to deliver to the people who are in need. Um, so uh, why did we go as an emergency director group to Ukraine and to, uh, to Nigeria? Because these uh, two crises are very complicated um, um, in, in, in every dimension. They're, they're complicated at the operational level, um, so to navigate uh, to the point of delivery is a challenge given the security uh, situation on the ground, in fact the conflict that is going on. Um, so we have to make sure that at the global level we are doing what we need to do to support our colleagues to overcome those obstacles. And secondly, um, because it's so politically complex, uh, and these are countries that also have uh, significant resources themselves, uh, middle income, uh, higher middle income countries. Uh, in fact, Nigeria is the richest country on the continent of Africa. We need to, we need to understand also how uh, to mobilize national capacity um, and to complement that rather than um, overriding it or substituting for it or neglecting it. Um, so uh, when you have these complex situations, it's absolutely essential that HQ and field are actually at one in understanding the challenges, in understanding the solutions uh, to overcome those challenges, and that we're all mobilizing with the same focus uh, and the same approach. And we're very determined in the emergency director group that it is 
is responsive to the field in the first instance. So we go out to the field to listen, to understand, and then to mobilize. Obviously, we contribute to that discussion uh, with our field colleagues, bringing to bear uh, global best practice. And I must say, it's a formula that has worked very well. John, you've spoken about the, really the preparedness that goes into all this uh, to be able to have the response, about the prepositioning, the fast financing mechanisms, the supplies, the national capacity, the political analysis. So looking at today's um, setup of the humanitarian actors, uh, how well would you say we're really doing in terms of being ready, in terms of having human resources, in terms of having the material, the financial resources to be able to respond to crises as they occur? Are we doing enough? So I think you've, uh, you, you've asked absolutely the right question here, and you've broken it down, in, you've broken it down into the right elements panels. Uh, on the human resources, on the, on the people side, being able to get the right people out quickly, um, I would suggest to you that we're doing very well. And we've seen in recent crises uh, the mobilization very effectively and very quickly of the right people um, to the right places um, in time, uh, the Philippines being uh, our last big uh, uh, challenge on that, uh, on that front. So on that side, yes, uh, I think as a community, we are well organized. We know who we should be sending. We've got them on standby, and we send them out um, uh, within a matter of, uh, of, of a couple of uh, hours. Uh, for the first teams are, are mobile. On the uh, financial side, I think that we have, uh, we've, we've come a long way. We're not quite there yet, but we are very significantly uh, um, forward from where we were a couple of years ago. Um, better utilization of the Central Emergency Response Fund. It's an automatic triggering of the release of those funds, um, which then uh, our partners can, uh, can quickly rely on. Uh, there are a lot of um, uh, improvements in terms of the rapid release uh, within humanitarian organizations um, who have now set up systems for prioritization and, and release of emergency funds as well. So both at the global level and also at the individual organizational level, systems and procedures have been streamlined to quickly release uh, financial uh, resources. We are, we are continuing to improve on that, and there's a lot of work going on at the moment on um, a, a, a standalone um, financial capacity um, for rapid response to what we call level three or those mega emergencies when they arise, because they need you know, something between 150 and 200 million dollars um, over the course of the first couple of months. We know that it's predictable. Um, it's the standard uh, um, demand that, that, that has been placed on us over the last couple of crises. So can we find a mechanism where we can, we, we, we can have that available to us at the outset rather than having to wait for the couple of months um, for that money to, uh, to flow in? Again, that's being worked on uh, right now. But the area where I think we are weakest, and uh, that's why this uh, webinar is so useful to have right now, is on the materials, the, the actual supplies themselves. Um, what we do in humanitarian response is, of course, relatively straightforward in the initial response. You're talking about the life-saving supplies of uh, high-energy biscuits, of water purification, shelter blankets, um, some uh, medical supplies, particularly around trauma kits. Um, it's not a long inventory of supplies, but because globally uh, our humanitarian system is very stretched, we do not have warehouses stockpiled with huge amounts of reserves. We're really working hand to mouth, and that's, that is a challenge for us uh, globally. But we do have huge uh, uh, supply chains in, in operation every day. So the question will be how can we quickly tap into those existing supply chains um, and divert large volumes of the absolutely essential life-saving supplies to the point of crisis. Um, now, in the Philippines, we saw that that did not work very well. Um, there was quite a gap between the deployment of the people and the mobilization of the supplies themselves. In fact, it was almost a week. And there's where we have to fix a problem. Um, the other issue that we will have to uh, work 
uh, on is how uh, also the, the transport of those supplies to the point of uh, delivery and to overcome uh, the obstacles that are always there. Infrastructure in a natural disaster is normally uh, quite uh, damaged if not destroyed. So you're talking about not just air assets to get them from the point of origin to the country of need, you're also talking about uh, a likely heavy, heavy dependence on air assets within the country and this, is, this moves to helicopters and, 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 and the like. And that's where we have been uh, very dependent on military uh, asset support. Um, so we'll have to continue to work very hard on the civil cooperation where again we have a standing, a standby standing capacity that um, will immediately mobilize to enable us to be able to deliver on the scale that we are needed to deliver in the first uh, 72 hours of a, of a crisis and then in the first weeks following on from there. As I say, these things normally have come into play over the first couple of weeks. Um, so we know what we need and we have a lot of experience around that. However, when it comes to the delivery of the supplies and the supplies themselves, we still right now today do not have the same level of preparedness, the same level of standby capacity as we do on the human and the financial side. Thank you. Thank Thanks, John, John, and really appreciate your openness and practice indeed by, by looking into the things that are critical. It's also important to be able to make this all uh, move forward. In today's, in today's webinar, webinar, we're looking into one particular, particular mechanism, mechanism, and this is the rapid response mechanism. John referred to what exists at the global level, level, and I just want to flag that we have shared with all of you a very brief compilation of the rapid response mechanism, really showing what exists at the global and at the regional level. Uh, of course, this uh, gives just a snapshot, I would say, because we all know also that several agencies, uh, UNHCR, WFP, WHO, many NGOs, have uh, some capacity or some stocks or a number of uh, stock spots at the regional level. So clearly what John is saying that the, today's crisis really are so big and so many that, we, that certainly there's a need to further improve, strengthen, and make sure that we're really up to able to respond to the volume as they, um, they uh, evolve in the operations. I'd like now to move to our uh, second guest and bring uh, in the discussion uh, Sylvia Danilov. Uh, Sylvia, I'd like to ask you, uh, in particular with the rapid response mechanism, a number of countries have now implemented this rapid response mechanism. I want to ask you what really prompted you and, and UNICEF to kind of put together this mechanism? What, what, what was the reason? And then if you can really describe very briefly how does it really work? If you can give us, if I can call it the recipe, the steps, so that colleagues who are listening to us from various corporations all over the world are really keen to be able to see how can they possibly take it over and put it in place in their operations. So, while working as a collective, they can really do their very best to ensure that delivery takes place in a fast area, often in, in, in people in need, often in a really rapidly evolving political or security situation on the ground. So, uh, Sylvia, over to you. Uh, thank you, Panos. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to all colleagues and friends around the world. Bonjour, salam. So just a bit of history, actually the RM approach was initiated in the Democratic Republic of Congo about 10 years ago. There was a recognition at the time that the emergency response of UNICEF but also of partners tended to be ad hoc and rather ineffective. Populations in Easter DRC then and also now were constantly being displaced by armed conflicts or natural disasters. Yet, each internal displacement man looking for a new partner to deliver assistance, each time having to mobilize additional financial resources and supplies. As a result, there were extremely lengthy delays in providing assistance to populations in dire need. So the RRM in the DRC was established with the objective of delivering fast and efficient assistance to the most vulnerable populations. Based on that model, which has substantially evolved in the past decade, there are today rapid response mechanisms in the Central Africa Republic, Iraq, and South Sudan, and Haiti also used to have one RRM that has been discontinued. 
So the RM shows tangible results today. In the DRC, it reaches an average of 2 million people per year. In Iraq, it's 1.3 million highly vulnerable displaced populations that have been reached since the summer of 2014 when the crisis started. South Sudan RRM model, where not one but several rapid response mechanisms coexist, has benefited more than 1.5 million people throughout 2013. The RRM uh, in CAR is actually more modest. We've reached more than 100,000 people in 2013. So as Panos, you asked me, let me uh, present you what uh, are the key ingredients for the RRM recipe. And please don't forget that each RRM is adapted to the specific situation in which it operates and is not a rigid model. And I know that uh, you will be sharing a matrix with all the participants that goes into some of the more detailed uh, observations on the similarities between the different RRM mechanisms, as you can see on the, on the screen. So the first key ingredient is really the pre-positioning of partners and supplies. In all the contexts where RRM exists, UNICEF has entered into direct partnerships with INGOs and funding them to maintain a full-time emergency response capacity. The RRM design departs from conventional emergency programming as it is essentially a contingency mechanism. Indeed, the RRM partnership doesn't specify where, how, and when exactly future interventions are going to happen. These are agreed upon by partners based on the vulnerability assessments undertaken in response to fast evolving emergency situations. Today, there are more than 15 key INGOs that are directly partnering with UNICEF in the four contexts. There is an average of 70 dedicated INGO staff for the RRM in the DRC, and Domitil will be discussing that in more details. And we also have, for example, 38 uh, dedicated INGO staff in the CAR in the Central Republic, uh, in the Central African Republic. In South Sudan, there are about 60 RRM teams, some directly funded by donors and led either by UN agency or directly by NGOs. And also large quantity of relief supplies are pre-positioned in country and costs for logistics and transport are pre-financed. Now the second key ingredient is really the continuous capacity that is maintained by the RRM for vulnerability-based assessments. All RRM partners have the capacity for maintaining a humanitarian watch based on their geographical coverage and access to wider alert systems. This information then triggers the implementation of initial multi-sectoral needs assessment. These are mostly locally adapted versions of the MIRA and enable to score levels of vulnerabilities in key sectors. In Iraq, for example, we have the Open Data Kit, which is feeding directly into the OCHA database. And today, half of the over 2,000 locations in Iraq assessed by humanitarian partners have been assessed by the RRM partners directly. In the DRC, we have multi-sectoral assessments, and they have been seen increasingly as reliable sources of information for all the partners and the HCT. The third key ingredient is the capacity for a rapid multi-sectoral emergency response. The response should be triggered when no other actors can intervene. Practice, however, shows that the RM has sometimes evolved into a de facto intervention of first resort. So the most basic RM package is implemented right now in Iraq. Either the RRM partners, the NGO partners, or UNICEF and WFP staff directly, when no partners are present, distribute what we call portable lightweight kits, comprised of an adult hygiene kit, drinking water, water immediate food response ratio, as well as buckets and jerry cans. The items should be sufficient for a family on the move for about seven days. In South Sudan, the RRM that is managed by both UNICEF and WFP aims to contribute towards reducing malnutrition. It includes vaccinating children, administrating vitamin A supplementation, undertaking nutrition screenings, and providing trainings to support capacity building of partners and community workers. In the DRC, over the years, innovations have refined the response package. 
For example, NFI fairs, non-food item fairs, are taking place, and today 70% of the NFI response is cash voucher based. And that has enabled the partners to reduce costs for the uh, supply response by approximately 20%. There is also in the DRC a strong component of emergency education response and also health mobile teams. In the DRC as well, the RM has integrated practical approaches to identi identify and meet the needs of people with disabilities, together with Handicap International, mainstream gender, and also facilitate an increased participation of affected populations. And then finally, what I consider to be the fourth key ingredient for the RRM recipe is the interagency coordination and governance structures that are actually similar, quite similar across the context. On a weekly basis in most of the countries, UNICEF meets with INGO partners, OCHA and other participating agencies such as WST but also IOM and also sometimes with donor representatives. They analyze incoming humanitarian alerts, multi-sectoral assessments, and decide whether assessments or, or and interventions are needed. The government stru governance structures include actually in all the contexts, the cluster lead agencies and also broader uh, stakeholder partnerships. The South Sudan model in this regard is a bit different because there, cluster coordinators are involved more directly in the coordination structure, structure and the OCHTA facilitated process. In any case, in all the contexts, the RM partners are systematically sharing information with the HCT and inter-cluster coordination fora to ensure the complementarity of interventions. However, we've seen through evaluations that the integration of RMM activities with other uh, interventions such as food uh, protection or health has not always been we uh, has not always been strong sometimes we say there is a double speed of the response uh, la casserole avant la nourriture which means the pots before the food and so we are always trying to ensure that the interventions are in, are integrated and holistic thank you Thanks, thanks, Sylvia. I've been taking note and from why you're talking and from what I can see, there are really six steps, just for, if I could summarize it, for colleagues in all of our operations. One is the pre-financing. So really you make sure that you have the money in place. So talk to your donors, explain the vulnerability of the situation to be able to respond very quickly and make sure you have some money in place. The second one is the pre-positioning. You really need to have as much as you can ready to be able to deploy if and when things go wrong and the humanitarian needs evolve on the ground. The third one, and these are not in order, but really it's the pre-identifying partners. You mentioned in one operation 15 partners, but knowing in advance the NGOs, possibly national partners, and also what you described about a governance structure. From what I hear, this is a light mechanism that exists for the rapid response, but you try to fit it in as much as possible within the existing clusters while you recognize also the shortcomings, maybe protection, maybe some areas. Bottom line, this is really top priorities about delivering to people in need. The fourth element I, I, I kept down is really what you call the maintaining the humanitarian watch really having your, your antennas tuned to the political security situation that results in displacement so you know at any given time what is happening to be able to press the green button so that the response can take place. Uh, a fifth area I've noted is the light, what you call need assessment and multi-sector or multi-sector response. So when you go out, you try to see what's happening. I've also seen in the matrix, and really thank you for compiling this matrix. I want to encourage all of you. It's been shared, and you've seen it also up in the screen, which gives a kind of a kind of just very brief highlights of the different models that are tailor-made to each context. So this light needs assessment is the fifth point, and then the sixth and most important is the delivery. Actually, the ability to move and uh, to be able within days or a few weeks to be able to deliver very quickly to the people in need with what is really needed. Now, this is all extremely important. You mentioned the question of protection, and you said that perhaps we're not doing enough 
on that. So I'd like actually to move to John and really ask uh, critical aspects like, you know, protection and humanitarian response is hugely important. So how does you, do you see this fitting with this, this rapid response and delivery in you know, our effort to be able to move uh, in a fast way? And that actually could involve protection, but also other non-material items that, uh, or issues that we should be uh, thinking of. Uh, John, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Panos, and um, you know, great compliment to uh, uh, UNICEF uh, in particular for the great work that they, they have been doing in developing uh, this mechanism at the at the field level with uh, all of their all of their partners. Um, on the protection, absolutely. I mean, what does what distinguishes us as humanitarians uh, is that we deliver in accordance to standards, principles, values. Um, and our legal obligations. So the centrality of protection cannot be overstated in its importance. Um, I would suggest to you that uh, uh, as humanitarians we are uh, increasingly aware of our responsibility uh, on protection. So I think that uh, where, where you are seeing uh, humanitarians leading on rapid response, um, you are seeing uh, protection very much at the center of their considerations. Um, um, so we're doing, I think, uh, pretty well there. I mean, for example, in every cross-line convoy in the Syria crisis, uh, there is a protection officer as part of uh, that convoy, showing the importance uh, that is attached to that. I think it's also interesting to reflect on the, on the difference between the approach recently in the Ebola-affected countries, where we didn't have the mobilization of a traditional humanitarian um, uh, rollout of our of our humanitarian capacity. The crisis was was not classified as a humanitarian crisis, and I won't be deflected by that debate just now. But what was interesting for me recently, being there and going through those uh, countries, was to see that without that without that uh, designation of humanitarian, um, there was there was an obvious deficit in the response on protection. And that resulted in, um, in many instances, a rather uh, inhumane uh, approach when it came to how people, um, human beings, uh, were dealt with. Um, and I'm in no way wanting to be critical. I have profound respect uh, for the um, heroic uh, effort that was, uh, that was made uh, to bring the Ebola virus uh, under control. Um, and um, I will be the first to stand and and uh, compliment uh, everybody that was involved. But just for the purpose of this discussion, I think it is useful and there are always lessons to be learned, no matter how good things are, uh, that things can be improved. And on this issue, um, without humanitarians mobilizing in their traditional um, frameworks and with their traditional approach, uh, protection was a casualty. Um, people were regarded as numbers rather than human beings and many things that could have been done to m have a more humane um, uh, approach vis-a-vis -vis things like uh, how people were treated when um, they were identified as um, uh, infected by the by the virus and brought into treatment units. Uh, there wasn't the same degree of follow-up in terms of making sure that they had contact in those treatment unions with their families, that their families were kept updated. So it became uh, a numbers issue um, uh, in the first instance, uh, uh, and as I say, quite understandable uh, given the challenges that, uh, that this uh, unique crisis pre 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 presented for us. But where you don't have protection uh, as a central uh, um, component of a response, it definitely has a big impact and it's quite negative, of course, um, in, every, in every respect. So I, I just highlighted from that point of view that we have seen the good practice, and we've also seen uh, the, the, the alternative um, in recent months. And I think that uh, we just have to keep working on making sure that centrality of protection in everything we do. Thanks, John, for highlighting this, because uh, indeed uh, the centrality of protection is, is crucial when we're looking at the fact that people in crisis situation, we always think of water or shelter, but uh, really bottom line, is about ensuring, bottom line is about ensuring that uh, we're also looking at the human rights situation and, and the best way to be able to address people in very vulnerable situations. Uh, Sylvia, I'm also keen to hear your views on that, but before I really would like to go first to Goma, 
And uh, we have uh, Domitil in line, we've been very patiently uh, waiting since uh, we started. Um, and Domitil, you're with the Norwegian Refugee Council, uh, you've really been on the front line of implementing the rapid response in the North Kivu, in the South Kivu, together with other NGOs that um, you're, you're, you're responding to the evolving crisis as it unfolds on a regular basis, because really it has changed a lot. So I'd really like to ask you, from your perspective as being an NGO member of this rapid response mechanism, how has it worked in practice? What's your experience in the Democratic Republic of Congo, having worked on this for the last four years? Uh, Domitil, over to you. Thank you for the question. Um, just to give you an, an overview of the RMP in DRC, it's implemented in, uh, in four provinces at the eastern part of the country. And in each province, there is one or two international NGOs that are delivering a multi-sectoral assistance in different sectors. So it can be in health, education, NFI, and WASH. So we are five NGOs, uh, Solidarité, Save the Children, IRC, AFC, and uh, NRC. So we are implementing this program uh, that is about uh, $36 million per year uh, with an important uh, coordination between us. So, for instance, if a crisis is too big to be covered by one NGO, we will go uh, and we will respond jointly. So, um, at the moment, RMP, um, I can say that RMP is one of the most effective models uh, in place of us to reach emergency needs uh, in Congo, thanks to the fact that we have the capacity to mobilize very fast human resources and capacities. Uh, for sure, uh, some improvements are always required as uh, working on the rapidity aspect, but we can say honestly that RMP is recognized uh, as an effective and efficient program in DRC. Uh, just to give you an idea, in 2014, more than uh, 400 multi-sectoral assessments uh, have been realized, 600,000 people have been assisted in NFI, uh, 400 in health, 300,000 in WASH, and 170,000 in education. Um, as an NGO partner, I wanted to um, emphasize three aspects of our work. Uh, the early warning of the humanitarian watch, where well, Sylvia talked about, the um, coordination of the assistance, and the assistance itself. So going back to early warning uh, or humanitarian watch, the RC context is very volatile. Um, it, it's unpredictable and it requires a constant follow-up uh, from NGOs. So depending on the provinces, but just to give you an idea, we can receive more or less five alerts per day, per week, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so RMP can't cover all of them, even if it would have been necessary to assess the zone and eventually to respond, but we don't have the capacity to, uh, to assess and to, yeah, to assess all the alerts we receive. So NGOs are responsible to do a permanent follow-up of the emergency situation in their respective provinces in order to be aligned to prioritize crisis and alerts and so to decide where multi-sectoral assessments or intervention are the most urgent and pertinent. So this is a permanent work for NGOs, member of the RMP. So this analysis is based on different aspects. It can be based on the size of the, of the movement, um, if the movement is ongoing or it's, if it's over, if uh, there is any intention of return, um, about protection risk, about uh, do no harm. So we have to do analysis, quite deep one, to be able to prioritize. So with this very volatile and unpredictable con context in the RC, um, displacement, for instance, can can learn from a day to a year. So that means that uh, we have to respond differently and it's differently needs also. So one of the main responsibilities of RMP partners is to make sure that they have uh, a global overview of the situation of the province through a network that is based with OCHA, with local partners, with other NGOs, uh, local authorities, etc., to assess and to define the priority alerts. And once the multi-sectoral assessment is done, then each NGO will share the report with all the humanitarian community. So RMP is doing this humanitarian watch 
to the whole humanitarian community in the RC. Um, a second point that I wanted to mention is uh, so the coordination of the intervention. So at this stage, um, considering that this particularly volatile context, we, um, and based on the MSR results, we still have to prioritize even for the intervention. Uh, because the context could have changed since uh, the end of the multisectoral assessment, or because all the crises could have flared up, so we have to prioritize again. So there is a, this is a proactive role of NGOs during the weekly steering committee of RMP to, to define with other actors the multisectoral response among RMP partners, but also uh, with other um, uh, actors that are covering sectors not covered by RMP, as food, for instance. So this process is also supported by OCHA, by UNICEF, and the Lead. And this coordination includes the, the whole cycle project, so from the multisectoral assessment, but including targeting process, selection of the modality of the assistance, uh, the delay, the timing, and all the general approaches in order to make sure that the um, two norm aspects will be analyzed and integrated. And, <coughs> sorry. and the last point I wanted to mention is um, so RMP partner, about assistance. RMP partner's role is to be, for sure, the most reactive um, delivering assistance, but without compromising the quality. So mainly based in uh, analysis of the context and the do no harm aspect. So thanks to the flexibility of this program, and also because of 10 years of existence, uh, RMP partners are, and UNICEF are really always looking for improvements in terms of approaches. So, um, for instance, it has conducted to a, a new targeting methodology approach based on vulnerabilities and no more on status uh, that is now used uh, by uh, humanitarian actors in general in DRC. Uh, new methodologies, new yeah, kind of innovation. Like now, assistance is uh, adapted to the needs and the size of the households, and uh, other people, other pilots, sorry, are going on. So it's really. Um, uh, uh, willingness to uh, to improve permanently our activities. Great, the line is not the best, but I think we can hear you. So, uh, Domitil, from what I can hear you saying, you're basically balancing in between the need to be able to respond fast, but also to ensure that you have a quality on what you respond. So I would like to ask you, in terms of uh, timing, can you give us a, just an indication, how long would it take, like if this morning you get a, a red warning from an area that is displacement, give us a bit of an idea of the time frame in between doing the needs assessment and responding, just a rough estimate to give the listeners a, a feeling. Yes, yeah, sure. So, um... It's all depending on the availability of the remand resources. We have the chance to be pre-financed, so we always have um, money and capacity, but it's depending on the human resources. So if this morning we receive an alert and if the team is available, they can leave tomorrow. If not, we have to wait for the end of the multi-sectoral assessment or intervention before being able to go to another zone. But I will say that more or less, usually we are um, with the sectoral assessments arrive in the zone uh, one to two weeks after the alert and the assistance, it can be done uh, from a month to two months, depending on the methodology. If it's distribution, it's faster. If it's a food fair or NFI fair, sorry, um, the time of doing the study market plus the selection of under plus 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 make time. Uh, but it's also depending on the sectors. For instance, uh, a cholera crisis, uh, the response will be done in the 24 to 80, 48 hours. So it's depending on the availability and the access. But I will say, yes, that more or less uh, within a week we are in the field to assess and uh, between one to two months the response is over. Thanks, Dolmitil. I can hear in your voice the sense of urgency to be able to respond within 24 hours, 24 hours and really keeping the people in need uh, in mind at uh, all times. I'd like now to move back to Sylvia, and I want to get back to, the, to this question of um, having a holistic approach in the 
in the rapid response mechanism. And I just wanted to ask you, is it really about delivering materials or is there a way that this rapid response could be a little bit more comprehensive of other needs without compromising both in terms of the quality and the speed with which your response takes place? Uh, Sylvia, over to you. Thank you, Panos. Actually, uh, it's true that the basic package of RM interventions is indeed focused on delivering essential life-saving supplies. Oftentimes, as uh, all the colleagues listening uh, know, the window of opportunity for interventions is time-bound due to high insecurity and access constraints, and that's also something John has said. This is where we have to improve in terms of fast delivery of supplies. And it's oftentimes more difficult to implement interventions requiring longer-term presence. But that also depends on the capacity of partners and the maturity of the RRM mechanism and ability to prioritize an integrated response to acute vulnerabilities. And I think Domitil has shown in the DRC there is a range of interventions that goes beyond the supply delivery. I want to also take the example, for example, in the South Sudan, where the UNICEF and WFP RRM uses a nutrition lens to prioritize locations for missions. So the mechanism complements food distribution with nutrition screening and treatment referral, access to safe water, and life-saving immunizations. And so even despite short-term interventions, RM partners are always aiming to identify, for example, former teachers or healthcare staff within the targeted communities, and they provide them with incentives or salaries, refresh their trainings, etc., to enable them to continue to work. I also want to get back maybe to, to the question of protection, and I'm glad, Panos, you asked it, and also I fully agree with John. Today's crises where we intervene and where the RRM is present are mainly protection crises. And then, actually, when the RRM was established, it was not initially designed with a protection lens, but over the years, it became apparent that it is essential to better articulate the role, RRM role in preventing and responding to protection violations because without that linkage, uh, our effectiveness in, in responding to, to the uh, humanitarian needs will be diminished. So there are ongoing and current efforts to mainstream protection in the overall RRM approach in all the four contexts where the RRM is present. But we're at the very early stages, and we also need to closely coordinate with the protection cluster and all the partners. Just to tell you, for example, last week, there was a training of trainers for IRM implementing partners in the Central Africa Republic. So the training focused on how we can integrate protection aspects in the multi-sectoral assessment, also how we can strengthen the capacity of partners to recognize protection issues, to include protection issues and report on them. Uh, in the CAR context, unfortunately, referral for protection is very limited, but it's been agreed that the RRM implementing partners are going to report directly to the protection cluster and members to ensure a follow-up of the response. And actually, the same discussions are taking place in Iraq, where, unfortunately, we are anticipating that the next waves of displacement will require rapid follow-up by protection cluster partners, and we're coordinating very closely with UNHCR the complementarity amongst the RRM mechanism and the protection approaches. Thanks, Sylvia. I've heard, I've heard you talking about uh, the partnership and discussion with the World Food Program on, on, on food security questions, on protection with the UN High Commission for Refugees. So I, can, I hear really an effort to be able indeed to, to broaden it and to make it a little bit more holistic or, or comprehensive. I'd like now to turn actually back to Goma, back to John Mithil, and uh, and ask really for your critical review a reflection on, on how has the rapid response mechanism worked so far. The Democratic Republic of Congo, it has been running really now for 10 years. It has evolved, changed over, over the time. I, I can see there's been some adjustments from what we saw from the notes uh, you have sent to us. So, Domitil, how, has, how is it working in the DRC? What are the points that we're learning uh, that could be useful for colleagues listening from other operations? Over to you, Domitil. Thank you. Um, 
I would say that one of the main points, uh, uh, lesson known, is that we have changed our, our global approach from a um, status strategy that has been used for years to a vulnerability approach. So, um, indeed, we realize that displacement affects also host families or host communities, and so they are now integrated and in including in their systems. So, um, that was a big change and an uh, important improvement. Um, according also to, to the DRC context, I find that RMP is, is focusing on quality. Rapidity is part of the quality strategy, but it's an indicator uh, of efficiency and of impact, but it's not only the only one. Uh, that means that we are also working on an accountability framework, we are also working on the production checklist or production mainstreaming, uh, we develop a huge MID system. So, rapidity is, is for sure really important for a program like us, but in Congo, we have, you need a so deep analysis of the context that it's not always rapidity that is the most appropriate answer. Um, RMP uh, in DRC, as you mentioned, uh, is running for a long time, and as different partners are implementing the program in the same region, in order to guarantee also the coherence of the program, uh, we have standardized and harmonized approaches for all the different partners. So now RMP is recognized as a, having a unique strategy in terms of targeting, in terms of responding, in terms of, um, of doing the post distribution monitoring. Uh, it's, everything is standardized in all the different provinces. So um, every year we have a global workshop, we also have technical days, technical workshops, and we want to make sure that the um, lesson learned and the improvements uh, that the partner acquired will be shared and will be used then by all the different partners. Um, another challenge we had in the last uh, few months and years, it was the coordination between food and NFI assistance. Um, they have to be or they should be combined in order to maximize the impact of the systems because methodology are the same, are very similar. So in DRC, RMP is not responding to food. Uh, this is why coordination with other actors in the sector is, is essential. And now it has become uh, a common practice. So food and NFI, it's the uh, same approach. So it's uh, individual targeting. And for these two principal needs, if one sector is uh, arriving a long time before the other, or if the targeting process has been done with different approaches, um, it will really reduce the global impact of both sectors. And uh, because the beneficiary will sell part of the assistance to cover the need of the other sector. So, in addition to, see, to be seen as incoherent by, by the beneficiaries, it's also for us a huge challenge to, uh, to make sure we coordinate our intervention, at least for NFI and, uh, and food sectors. And uh, as they some learn also, uh, RMP is a very flexible program. And uh, it is now in DFC we also recognized, uh, if I can say, as a humanitarian laboratory in terms of innovation. So, um, because thanks to the flexibility of RMP, um, partners have tried uh, some innovation that have then been scaled up in the RC and used by other humanitarian actors. For instance, uh, as uh, NFI fans, as uh, school vouchers, as cash for latrine. So thanks to the flexibility of this program, RMP partners are really encouraged uh, to test innovative practices, which can be then scaled up at the country level, but to make sure that we are always uh, having the willingness to improve and um, yeah, to improve the quality of our assistance. Thanks, thanks, Domitil. Um, I'd like to move actually to Sylvia. And as you were describing, really the rapid response in the various operations, clearly. I had in mind two issues. One is it takes leadership, obviously, to be able not to wait for things to happen, but really to take the, the, the bull by the horn and to be able to say that's what we're going to do. So I wanted to hear a little bit from you on how you've gone about that. And then obviously it does take risks. It does involve risk taking. If we're waiting for everything to be perfect and safe, we'll never move. So can you just make very briefly uh, share some reflections on both re leadership and risk-taking. 
Uh, yes, of course, Thanos, because actually I really believe that first and foremost, there is a need for a very strong leadership and partnership as the core of the RRM approach. Wherever we, UNICEF, has led and established and implemented the real RRM, we didn't do it alone. Strong INGO partners are needed both in the design and implementation phase. Support from OCHA is essential for IM in information management and coordination, and also, ideally, engagement from all cluster lead agencies should be encouraged from the start, either as direct RM partners or, for example, to coordinate and complement interventions. In practice, however, I must say that it's not always possible to secure the buy-in from the whole HCT, the humanitarian country team, from the onset. And this may, in effect, sometimes even slow down the RRM initial establishment. In the medium to long run, without a strong HCT and cluster engagement, the RRM impact is limited. But uh, in the beginning, we are sometimes trying to also focus on results rather than coordination, which is something we have to balance in the long term. And then also on the leadership and partnership, donors' involvement and buy-in from the start is extremely valuable. For example, in the DRC, uh, we have a very strong donor base because we've been operating for more than 10 years, whereas I've mentioned Haiti, RRM was discontinued, and that was also maybe a reflection of the failure to attract donors and engage them in the mechanism. Then on your second point, most definitely, uh, the RRM requires a certain level of risk taking and operating outside of the traditional way or outside the box because we have to have the ability to anticipate humanitarian needs and plan for an adequate response in terms of supply propositioning, human resources, financial capacity to respond, and, and then we might also have mistakes when we, we plan ahead. Uh, in contexts such as uh, Iraq and South Sudan, when no partners are present in some of the newly accessed conflict areas, direct implementation by UN agency has become the norm. And this requires that the agencies, and, and I can speak specifically about UNICEF, because we are really reviewing right now our own modus operandi and internal rules to facilitate such approaches and, and, and look at risk management and risk mitigation approaches in, in the context of a high threat uh, environment. Thanks, Sylvia. Indeed, uh, risk mitigation approaches are really Im important because uh, otherwise, I mean, we are living in an environment where security is increasing, getting worse and worse. Yes, we have to make sure that we do not become over-risk averse and to really be able to balance this uh, security analysis with the program criticality and to take the risk to be able to deliver is really hugely important. I'd like now to move to John, and John, I want to ask you, if I am a humanitarian worker in the field right now, maybe a member of an HCT or a member of a cluster or intercluster, practically, what do I need to do in order to start a rapid response mechanism? Is there a procedure in place or how, how, how simple is it to start it in the field? John, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Panos. And um, I mean, uh, also when you listen to what uh, Damatele is telling us about the practicalities of this, I think we begin to uh, really see uh, the essential here. The good news is that uh, uh, we're not talking about procedures or processes, and people should not look to headquarters to start developing a new package of, uh, of policies, procedures, and documentation. This is field-driven. Uh, we are, uh, of course, as humanitarians, uh, uh, obliged to be able to respond effectively. Um, where we can anticipate, be prepared, this is also a part of our professional responsibility. So what, what uh, is to be encouraged here is that, you know, globally we see this good examples that we have now from the countries that have been uh, cited as what we've said so many times in the transformative agenda, decentralize, empower the field, uh, give the field the support that they need to do the job that they need, that they know needs to be done. Um, so if you are a HCT member, a cluster member, uh, a humanitarian out there, of course you should be asking the question, where is our rapid response uh, capacity? Um, certainly if you're in, in an environment where you have 
the likelihood of there being a need um, and in so many places where we work we're not just dealing with today's response but we're also uh, knowing full well that uh, that urgent situations will arise particularly in conflict zones where there will be uh, large-scale displacements and we also can predict what we need to do to save lives. Um, our work at, at that level, at the life-saving level, is rather straightforward, rather simple. What we need to deploy uh, in terms of supplies, what people will need. We don't need to go with uh, our notebooks to do a comprehensive assessment when uh, thousands of people have been displaced, uprooted from their home, fleeing uh, a, a conflict. We know immediately that they will need some very basic food supplies. They won't have the facilities to cook that, so high energy biscuits, for example, uh, are absolutely essential. We know that children will have particular needs. We know that uh, shelter will be a requirement. We know that clean drinking water will be a challenge, and we know that um, uh, uh, some medical, basic medical supplies will, will also be needed. So uh, it's not rocket science here, but it's absolutely essential that we are ready, um, that we are uh, uh, prepared as we can be to deploy in a rapid response uh, um, uh, the, 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 the supplies, the, the support that is, uh, that is needed. So what, 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 what every HCT should, should now be looking at is looking to themselves on how can they organize themselves within their own capacities. There isn't one approach um, that will fit every country setting because there are different capacities, there are different demands that are there. Um, but every HCT under HC leadership should be putting in place uh, a rapid response capacity that uh, if and when they're called upon suddenly um, to respond to uh, a, an escalation or a new uh, component of the, of the humanitarian response, that they can get out there, not just to assess what's going on, but in, in tandem to deliver um, on the immediate needs that can be anticipated. Um, and we've seen this, as I say now, in a number of countries down to great effect. I, I, I really do join what Sylvia said about um, you know, the buy-in from uh, different uh, organizations. This isn't every organization responding together every time. It's the key operational organizations, uh, NGOs and UN agencies, in a small group uh, going with the essential immediate supplies uh, and support, protection again, let's not forget that, absolutely essential, that that's part of every response, that they mobilize within hours of, uh, of, of, the, of the outbreak of, of the new dimension to uh, the crisis, um, and that they deliver uh, effectively and then come back consolidate, uh, review, and go again um, uh, as, um, as, as is needed. But um, as I say, this is a field-based, field-driven, field-designed, field-devised, field-implemented uh, mechanism, and I would strongly commend that it, it, it remain uh, within the uh, purview and uh, remit of uh, humanitarian country teams under the leadership of the humanitarian coordinator to actually uh, make sure that they have that uh, at their disposal in every setting. And then we at the headquarters level, we should of course um, be there in support, sharing global best practice, just as this webinar is doing, um, and of course, um, you know, making sure that uh, that, that organisations uh, who have institutional uh, expertise and capacity, because they do this in various countries, are the ones that uh, that, that that step up first uh, where they can. But if they're not capable in a given setting of doing that, then it doesn't relieve others of the responsibility to step up. As I say, every, every country team should have this component to their response. Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, I want to move back to you. You've heard John saying, uh, basically, the ball is in your court. Uh, it's, uh, it's up to the operations to take it and tailor make it and respond. Uh, Sylvia, you have taken the model, you've adopted it in, in several countries. Do you feel the colleagues in the field reach to further reinvent the wheel? How do you think they should go further if they want to apply it in their operations? Over to you, Sylvia. 
Thank you. I, I fully echo what John has said, that it's really a decentralized approach and the focus is on the rapid response capacity. Now, we've talked about rapid response mechanism and the mechanism as I presented and Domitil as well from the field perspective is not maybe a mechanism for all situations. So really the uh, humanitarian actors have to assess the scope, scale of an emergency and also uh, existing capacity in country before deciding to establish a rapid response mechanism. I would say that um, such an RRM is best adapted to context of chronic and protracted crisis with peaks of humanitarian needs, uh, the prepositioning of supplies, funds and partners when it will guarantee a rapid and quality life-saving response. But it will be quite costly to establish and maintain an RRM in situations, for example, with smaller scale emergencies where the HCT could rather invest in emergency preparedness measures and strengthening the response capacity of existing um, actors. And then, you know, when you start it, you have to go incrementally with some basic interventions um, targeting geographical locations with highest humanitarian needs. Um, as we said, it's very important to identify some of the key strong partners, but I agree with John. Uh, it has to be a highly operational smaller group and really the focus is on the response, the quality and the fast response, and then the investment in terms of coordination and, and, and ideal coordination governance structures can come further uh, down the line. And then finally, as you say, Panos, let us not reinvent the wheel. There are plenty of resources and tools that have been tested, tried, piloted, monitored, evaluated that can be easily adaptable to new contexts, you know, multi-sectoral assessment tools, TORs for the coordination bodies, um, you know, so SOPs, uh, standard operating procedures for rapid response. We also have lessons learned and evaluation reports. And really, finally, don't hesitate to call upon all those colleagues around the world who have directly participated in the design and implementation of RRM mechanisms. These are colleagues who are working with INGOs, UN agency, donors, partners at field and headquarters level. There is actually a very big RRM community out there. I know some of them are listening uh, today. And I know everybody's eager to share knowledge, best practices, and their love sometimes to the RRM. So please call upon us, all of us to help you with your initiatives that have to be field driven. Thank you. Thanks, Sylvia. This is really much appreciated. Actually, some of the listeners are already sending us a message, and I want to go to John and, uh, and ask you, John, some are saying, fair enough, you're saying really the ball is in our court, uh, we have the decentralized, we can go ahead and uh, really implement it. But let's say if an operation still needs some help, still needs some further guidance, where can they go in order to get uh, further support in terms of uh, rapid response mechanisms? Is it a central authority or, or an agency, or how do they proceed uh, also within the cluster system as they're working? John, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you, Panos. And uh, I think my message here today is that, uh, that my field colleagues should be pleased that we're not seeking to set up elaborate structures or mechanisms at headquarters um, to mirror uh, this uh, uh, approach at the field level. This is very much a field a field-driven and field-led um, uh, initiative, um, which again, as, uh, as Sylvia has highlighted, has to be tailored to uh, the different country contexts. Um, but at the same time, at the HQ level, we are uh, also seeking to play our role to support um, uh, our field colleagues with, with this, without going the inevitable route that, uh, that has been our failing over the years, where we, we overly bureaucratize um, or overly over-engineer uh, good initiatives at the field level, um, making it ultimately counterproductive uh, to the objective. So what I would say is that um, there are a number of organizations that, uh, that have played a leading role at field level, UNICEF of course being one, NRC being another, and uh, other partners um, uh, out there in the countries where we have this mechanism uh, operational. Uh, we in the emergency director group are looking at this in our um, mission to where we went together to the DRC. We took 
careful note of the good work that was being done there. It's on our agenda uh, as an emergency director group to see how we, again, at the global level, can, without, uh, uh, you know, doing anything that would be that 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 would be bureaucratic or counterproductive uh, how we can also uh, enhance the global level understanding on this issue in terms of how we can be supportive and best supportive i would suggest that it will go through um, uh, the agencies uh, that are that are leading at the uh, field level in the first instance and we will we will look at uh, at also making sure that other global level mechanisms uh, such as the undac and uh, insurag and other emergency response capacities at the global level are also aligned the global cluster uh, uh, system uh, to enhance uh, the support that uh, that is required based on the lessons learned from the implementation of of these uh, initiatives at field level um, as we go forward. Um, so we don't, you know, we don't have a replica at the global level for this at the moment, and I would suggest that that's a good thing because the evolution of this, if you look at country by country, it has been, it has been the same concept, but it has been operationalized in a modified way depending on what the resources are, the capacities are, the needs are, and the dynamics are in each of the countries involved. And that's something that we should promote and support rather than, you know, as I say, over-engineering uh, this particular uh, initiative. But we will continue um, from the interagency perspective, we will continue to uh, look at this um, and, uh, and, and, and continue to think about the ways that we uh, at the global level can can support this uh, going going forward. Thank you. Thanks, John. This is very helpful. So basically, you're saying we don't need a big melting pot where everybody falls into it, but we really value the individual initiatives, the agency strength, the capacity. This is a good example. It's not the only one. There are other ones, and really, we encourage all these. Bottom line is to be able to deliver fast and as a system to be able to reach the people we need in the quickest possible way. I'd like us actually to move to Goma, and I'm taking now questions that are coming in. I want to acknowledge all of you have sent questions and encourage all of you who haven't. We still have a few more minutes to the end of this webinar. And one of the questions that came in, uh, it really talks about the rapid response mechanism and how it fits with the cluster response. And uh, there's also a comment that we got uh, from, from Cyril, Lekiev, who is saying that basically roving field support teams managed by global clusters have proved to be quite effective in his own context. So, uh, Domitil, how do you basically balance in between having the rapid response mechanism, you talked about that small uh, light um, uh, management team, and at the same time, how does it fit within the cluster? Because we do have a system in place, so do the clusters know about it? Do they have an opportunity to participate? Is it an open club? How do you make it fast and light at the same time? Domitil, over to you. Thank you. Uh, actually, we have a, a weekly steering committee uh, from, for RMP in each province, and all of the cluster lead and co-lead are attending to this meeting. So information are shared uh, on a weekly basis. Then uh, each partner, is a, each RMP partner, as, a, as an NGO, is always uh, attending to uh, different clusters and also presenting activities. RMP or um, regular ones. So um, maybe I would say it's a duplication, the RMP weekly steering committee, but it's, um, it's also an opportunity to, to discuss and to analyze the context. And information are always shared publicly. Thank you. Thank you, Domitil. John, I'd like to come back to you and just ask you actually the same question in terms of uh, the rapid response mechanism within the cluster, in terms of architecture. How do you see it really kind of uh, squaring the circle in, or, in order to be able to move it forward? 
Uh, essentially, uh, Panos, where, where it has worked best, um, it, it, it is a tool, it's an instrument of the, of the entire community. Even if the entire community is not, uh, humanitarian community is not participating, uh, they must see it as their tool. Um, and uh, they must uh, also have, um, you know, again, a coordination, um, which again is not heavy in its, uh, in its bureaucracy, but uh, one that is transparent. As, as Damatil has said, transparency, um, which then allows the opportunity for those who can contribute to do so. Um, and, uh, and it's not a new, uh, you know, a new additional layer of complexity. It's merely a streamlining of existing structures um, for a particular purpose. So the purpose is we've got to respond rapidly um, and uh, therefore we are going to streamline our existing capacity to be able to do that um, in the optimal way. So we will always need to have our cluster framework, um, but we don't need to roll out the entire cluster framework in every single rapid response uh, that, we, that we have to conduct. And that's why I would appeal to everybody to keep this um, very uh, purpose-driven. Um, every situation will require a, a, a certain adaptation of the response. That's just the nature of our, of our work. We have to have a core capacity to this, and that's why in places where it's working really well, you have um, uh, certain agencies that are central to that. It, it requires that to be expanded in some circumstances. It may even require it to be even contracted further in other circumstances. The key here is when we talk about something that, uh, that is uh, driven by uh, the uh, operational circumstance, we should be flexible enough to be able to adapt uh, to that. So I would suggest that again, the uh, role of the HCT and the HC uh, is absolutely critical in providing the support that's needed to that core nucleus group that are the essence of the capacity that will take this on when uh, it, is, uh, it is required and be flexible and responsive to uh, what uh, those who are in the leadership of the rapid response capacity are asking of their sister agencies and organizations in terms of, of support. Thank you. Uh, thanks, John. I'd like to move to Sylvia. I'd like to move to Sylvia with a question that goes a little bit beyond the rapid response. We have a question from uh, Ukraine, from uh, Ninel who is asking, do you think that it's important to coordinate the C4D, the communication for development, in an emergency? And uh, do you have examples of that? Uh, Sylvia, over to you. Yes, thank you um, to the colleague from Ukraine uh, for the question, because actually I think we've seen it in, in most of the crises, and, and John was mentioning the Ebola crisis, how it is important to have a strong capacity approach and coordination for, community for uh, communication for development, social mobilization, when it comes to preventing some of the uh, practices um, and, and raising community awareness uh, in the field, it's very important to have both the offer, I mean the access to services and, and the delivery of supplies, but also the demand from the communities themselves to some of these uh, services. Uh, if I take the example of the RRM, for example, in South Sudan, but that's the case in the other context as well, um, we have, of course, the colleagues working in local languages, and we are trying to look at all the entry points to communicate to community members um, and raise community awareness, for example, on the importance of infant and young child feeding and practices, uh, good hygiene, um, prevention of uh, stress, prevention of uh, protection violations, and, uh, and also all the, all the uh, aspects of, of, uh, of hygiene and water and sanitation. Uh, in the context of Ebola, I mean, going beyond the RRM response, we've seen that it's been very uh, important to have a strong collaboration, coordination, and capacity on social mobilization, and that's certainly a field where we should be investing even further uh, in the future. Thanks, Sylvia. We still have a few more minutes and lots of questions coming, so I'm going to ask all speakers to be as brief as possible in their answers. We actually have a question that comes from Myanmar. Luis is asking, and Domitil, I'd like to ask you this question. 
The question is about the use of cash, cash grants and the rapid response mechanism. The question is disbursements of the cash grants and rapid response uh, mechanism can cause logistics problems. Uh, and it really sometimes it can increase, but also one has to look into the the markets and what's still working and what's available in, able, in, able, in order to be able to apply it. So, Domitil, uh, very briefly, can you tell us your experience about using cash in the rapid response in the DRC model? Over to you. Yes, sure. Um, in terms of NFI assistance, which is uh, our biggest sector of assistance, uh, we are using cash at 80% uh, of the time. But in DRC, we are facing a major issue as there is no uh, microfinance institution, the mobile phone network is not functioning, um, giving cash, direct cash, is uh, we don't have security access for. So our main activity is FAIR. Uh, FAIR, you give uh, vouchers to your beneficiary and they go to um, exchange their voucher against the item they want, so they choose it themselves, and then you, you pay the vendors. So because of the context of GRC, we are using fares as much as possible when uh, the market, the local market, market can, um, can supply the fares. Domitil, this is really quite innovative. So basically you're saying if there is no market in place, create your own market. And, and fair, from what I understand, is a kind of like a, a place where it's like an artificial market. You preposition NFI, shelter items, and whatever is needed. You give the people you're trying to help a coupon, and then they can go to this artificial market and buy, so to speak, the item. So that is really quite an innovative way where a commercial market doesn't exist, where you basically you can create your own market in order to be able to move with a rapid response. And most importantly, give really the power to the people we're trying to help in terms of selecting what is it that they need the most and how they would like to spend the, the coupons, the, the assistance that is provided to them. So that's really a good uh, way forward. Uh, John, I'd like to come back to you. And, and really, we have a key question that we're getting here in terms of the funding and financing. One of the listeners has sent us a question and saying, that uh, as Sylvia described it and Domitil talked about it and you spoke, a key issue for the success of the rapid response is pre-positioning. It's really preparing and having the items as much as possible that are needed. So if a crisis hits, one can mobilize within hours to send them to the people that are needed. Now, at the same time, the Central Emergency Response Fund, and you've spoken about that, which is very much appreciated, during a crisis, yet it doesn't allow for pre-positioning. So do you think the, need, the surf needs to be adopted? Should some change take place? How could operations make use of surf funding and at the same time pre-position while this is not allowed? John, over to you. Uh, thanks, Panos. Um, most definitely the, the pre-positioning has to be funded. The question is from where? I would suggest to you that uh, the SURF is not the address for the pre-positioning. The SURF is the address for the response. It, it, it's, its title tells you what it is. It's the Central Emergency Response Fund. It's not a pre-positioning fund. But we absolutely acknowledge that this is where the different financing instruments and this is where, again, agencies and organizations themselves have to work in complement with the instruments like the SURF. Knowing full well, that the surf can pay for the response itself. Um, and so therefore you can be reimbursed for the costs that have been involved in doing the response. Um, but you won't get it from the surf to actually have it pre-positioned in preparation for the response itself. Um, and I think that, uh, again, the different windows and the different mechanisms for financing need to be aligned to ensure that, well, if the surf is not going to pay for the repositioning, then how do we get donors to pay uh, through uh, agencies and, uh, and, and NGOs to enable them to, to, to preposition? Um, because prepositioning is absolutely key to, uh, to, the rapid, to the rapid response capacity. Thanks. Thanks, John. Um, I'd actually, actually like to move to another question we got uh, from uh, Joanna online, 
uh, who is asking, and then Sylvia, I'd like to ask you if you can uh, reply to this question. It is about really the selection of partners. So the question is, are there any criteria when you look into which partners to select? Do you go only with international NGOs? or about national partners? Uh, so what does it take? How do you really, when you go about the selection, what is your criteria in order to, to have this team of colleagues who are ready to, to mobilize and uh, respond? Sylvia, over to you. Uh, thank you, Joanna, for the uh, question, which is very pertinent. Um, actually, uh, all the examples we've we've had so far on RRM, we've we've looked at I we've looked at NGO capacity, one to be able to respond and have uh, experience. Second, having a multi-sectoral uh, mandate, so that the, as we discussed, the importance of a multi-sectoral and holistic response. Third, also the geographical coverage and, and, and experience working in certain contexts. Now, the focus of the RRM is really on a fast and efficient response, and so far we have partners mo mostly with INGOs because they have had the capacity and experience and multi-sectoral approaches to, to the response. But I must say we are also investing in the national capacity of partners for the sustainability of the response. So in the DRC RRMP mechanism, there is a component of strengthening the national capacity. And also in South Sudan, in certain places, we don't have ING partners. So we are also going with local local actors. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, I see there's a comment actually that comes from South Sudan. Abdelkader is sending us a comment saying that actually the rapid response mechanism has given a, an opportunity for a rapid interagency assessment with rapid response that has taken place simultaneously, which means that they assess and they deliver at the same time. So thanks, Dr. Carter, for sharing this uh, also good example on, on terms of what you're doing. And what is interesting is you're also saying that the mechanism you have also tried to link the rapid response with the longer term assistance that, uh, that is uh, in place. So um, um, with this one, I'm actually going to bring this uh, webinar to a close. Uh, there is a questionnaire that is uh, actually, you can see it on your screen right away, that I really want to ask everybody to take a minute and respond. We want to hear your evaluation on this webinar. How did you find it? Was it useful? Uh, please be blunt and honest. We're trying constantly to improve in terms of our communication for best practices. Also, would appreciate if you share us, with us what any suggestions you may have for uh, future webinars. I would like to remind to everybody that the same webinar we're repeating live again at uh, 4 p.m. Geneva time. So if any of your colleagues uh, who was not able to listen this morning uh, is very welcome to be able to join in this uh, afternoon discussion uh, as well. I'd really like to thank very much our speakers, uh, John Ging, who was with me here in Geneva, Sylvia Danilovov, who was uh, in uh, New York, and uh, Domitil Gali in uh, Goma. We really value very much uh, being with us uh, this morning and sharing your reflections, your, your thoughts, your way forward, and, and sharing a good practice, a good model, with the idea of uh, Taylor making it as much as possible in the field. For all colleagues listening to us, and I, I value the fact that we've had a constant uh, fellowship and, and, and colleagues listening throughout this webinar for the last hour and a half. Really, thank you for joining us uh, this morning, and uh, we'll keep you posted as uh, more webinars uh, will be coming uh, in the coming weeks, uh, always focusing, focusing on the transformative agenda, showcasing best practices, and how to hopefully help us to become more efficient, more effective in our endeavor to support the humanitarian operations in the on, the on the ground. So thank you again to everybody and wish you all a, a good day. Goodbye from us in Geneva.